Hello everyone! In this video I'm going to talk about presentation boards for architectural presentations and tips and tricks that you might use to create a nice presentation board. In theory, in theory this is sort of like drawing composition. It's just instead of dealing with a single drawing like I have in other presentations, uh, this is about combining multiple drawings together into one big image and the, and the things you might consider when you're doing that. I mean ultimately it's like any drawing. Um, as you're composing a set of drawings, what you really want to do is tell a story through the architecture, um, as we'll get into. Um, that's the key concept. Uh, I am doing something a little different in this video. Uh, the examples I'm going to use for the drawings are actually student work. So let's go take a look and see what they are. All right, so uh, let me start by introducing the student drawings that we'll be going over. Uh, this presentation is a project that I uh, worked with the students on, which was for this new neighborhood. It had a little campus. Uh, this is actually a little uh, athletic facility uh, uh, here. They studied a building in depth. It was mainly dealing with site planning and uh, new roads and infrastructure and buildings and neighborhoods was the main idea, street sections and perspectives. You can see all those good things here. It's a big drawing. Like this is on your small screen now, but this was lots and lots of work. Uh, multiple presentation boards, as we'll see as we go over concepts of how to organize presentation boards. It was really nicely done. I mean, not just the organization of the presentation board, but the drawings themselves are also very nice. Uh, it was a group project for students. And the other other student uh, work I'm going to look at today is this one because I find it really interesting. As well, this was also a, a group project, and these students, they were, I think they were only in their second semester design class, so they were very young students. Uh, they were working on this competition that had to do with this chapel, and they were really experimenting with SketchUp. They were using SketchUp for the 3D modeling, but the, this idea of organic forms versus, you know, a modernist glass form and how they play off of each other on this waterfront. So I thought... Uh, you know, completely different level of student work, just a single board, uh, less drawings, but really interesting. So I thought it was a good example, and, and I would also show this. Um, what I'll do is I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back and forth between these example drawings and uh, the actual concept. So again, I mentioned this already, mentioned it many other times, but fundamentally, the um, whole point of putting in a nice presentation the biggest thing is you want to tell a story about the architecture uh, just like in single drawings and I've talked about this concept in single drawings it is true when you're putting multiple drawings together you know how will it look how do you read uh, uh, what do you understand at first and so on and so forth so you know you might this is this diagram here and we'll see various diagrams like this throughout this presentation is meant like most people start reading a page because of reading at the top left and work right and down. But you don't necessarily have to do that for a drawing presentation, um, but you have to understand that that happens and there's a flow to the way people's eyes will move across the page. And what drawings are you used to tell that story? And there's multiple ways, there's details in this presentation on how to make that work, but ultimately it goes back to what you're really trying to say about your architecture. How did the design come about? So on and so forth. And so uh, when I got a little red dot here, that means to jump to the um, images to talk about various concepts. So jumping back to here, we can look at this and start to say, okay, well, you might think in your own mind, what might have been the stories the, the students were trying to say? And um, I I'm, I'm, don't remember now exactly what the students' full concept was. This was some years ago, but I can, you know, make some ideas about what it might be. Certainly from the architecture perspective, I think there's re this relationship there. Their idea of a chapel was about the relationship of, I guess, religious experience being tied to nature and all those things. So you see those organic forms really coming up in the play with the building being partially on land and partially in the water. I think was sort of that view of the religious experience, which I think comes comes across really well in their um design um in terms of how that fills out all the way to the presentation drawings i think there's some interesting moves about taking an overlap it's very rigid presentation which is can be good but they break the boundary here sort of as the organic forms appear 
don't follow rigid rules. Neither does it in in this piece pieces here, right? Might have been interesting if maybe some things happened here as well. Like maybe some of these pieces could have come down, um, and so on and so forth, and really breaking the plane a little more often. But I think you know for for sort of first year work, it's pretty good. Uh, and then we've got this one over here, which is a much bigger story to be told, right? And I think it's pretty clear, like organizationally, it's it's pretty clear that you're supposed to start by reading it over on this side. You have the holistic images with all the buildings, both in plan and 3D, some concept stuff. And as you sort of work to the right, you get more detail as you need to see that detail to understand it and sort of finishing on some more sexy uh, renderings like over here. So I think from like having the eye read across the page and tell that story, it's working really well in terms of, uh, you know, the drawings themselves tell that story. Again, I think a lot of this was, you can see the river back here and there's an idea about building up sort of a main street on one side, naturalizing it on the edge on the other. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that story begins to co come out well as you're reading across the page to see that. So if I come over here, the next next thing I want to talk about was like drawings. I think when I talked about composition and drawings, I talked about orientation, landscape, and portrait. And the same thing, you have to decide. Uh, you have to decide landscape and portrait when you're whole, putting together a presentation. What page size you're going to be working with? Um, it really doesn't matter. But as I said before, like all things being equal, um, landscape is better. Um, because of just the way human eyes work side by side, we see more horizontally. And that's why screens and phones and everything is sort of landscape oriented for the most part. And we're used to it. That said, that doesn't mean that there's never a time for things to be portrait because things aren't always equal. Um, and sometimes it does make sense. And we'll see as we sort of go through here, maybe, maybe I have this follow, followed up. Actually, there's sometimes um, when you might have a landscape view, um, but have portrait pieces of paper. If you have multiple pieces of paper, we'll see that as we get towards the end of this. So you can even work uh, on that level um, when you see that. So um, obviously if I if we look at the examples here, both of these are, well, this one is landscape, right? So that, that sort of makes sense. Um, and then this one is a portrait organization let me get rid of this sketch here and so i think again for this one it might have been a requirement for the competition now i don't remember i know the page size was required don't know if orientation was also specified but i think to a certain degree going portrait on this makes sense because of the right these sort of columns or organic forms rising up into the air the choice of going portrait with this is going to tell that story of rising up out of the water and so hey Things aren't equal on this one. Let's go with portrait. I think that was a good choice by these students. Um, anyway, moving on, I'm going to go to margins. Uh, you know, margins is something that I know some of these things in page organization, they're going to be boring, like margins talk. But you know what? They're important. They're easy to do. But often, if you don't think about it, and young designers often skip over these easy things, and they could have had such better work had they spent three seconds thinking about it. Margins, definitely one of these things. So as a general rule, I would say all your margins across the board, they want to be equally spaced. There is, however, one exception, um, and that's the bottom margin. To give it sort of a base and a weight, it's OK if the bottom margin is larger than the rest of the margins. But generally, you want to keep them all the same size. Or like I've shown in this example, the bottom one can be larger, especially if your title is going there or other such things. And so we can sort of, uh, actually, I'll go through, let's see, um, full bleed. I'll come here first uh, before looking at examples. Full bleed is a concept where uh, the ink of your print goes all the way to the edge edges of the paper. Um, some printers can full bleed, many cannot, um, but you can still sort of cheat it. You know, if you need to print like the plotters that we have at my school, the inkjet plotters, they won't print to the edges, but you could print the page, cut off the margin, it'll print to like with a, when a half inch, cut, cut, cut that off the page, and then you have a full bleed, right? So there's a way of sort of reverse engineering it. Um, 
and it can be very dramatic, like not have basically full bleed means not having margins at all. I like suppose not having margin at all arguably means the margins all of equal size. They're an equal size of zero. Uh, but I do think there's there's sort of in between ways of looking at this as well. And what I mean by that is based, well, let's take a look at the drawings. I think that's a, that's a way of drawing. You can look at this. So this, this drawing is full bleed. There's color everywhere along the edge. You know, you, you trim it off. That said, even though it's full bleed and, and this perspective even is, you know, the sky becomes the background image. The other rest of the images, they're not really full bled. They, they do have margin spaces. And so you can see there's a decent job of making this margin, that margin, that margin all equal. Down here, I think this margin tends to be a little larger. This one's about the same. I think it's okay that this one's probably a little larger because it's so separated from the work up here um, that it, it works okay. But may, maybe we could they could have shifted this over ever so slightly. But again, I don't think it matters there. They, they, they've held to it enough that, it, that it's working all right. And then when you come over here, uh, this work really does show sort of a hybrid as well, where some of these first important images that make the eye tell the story to come over here first, they're full bled here. But, uh, and then some choices too, like I think some of these important ones, they we sort of get some full bleed action, but you'll notice that it's pretty clean otherwise, that the margins around the rest of it are pretty equal all the way around. And so that's pretty good. And it really brings us uh, to the next point as well. So like margins, you have spaces between drawings. And generally speaking, the space between, between drawings should also be equal. Now, the space between drawings does not need to be necessarily the same as the margin size. If anything, they're often smaller than the margin size, but the spaces between the drawings should be equal. Now, there's always exceptions to that rule to a certain degree. Uh, so for example, sometimes line uh, work, especially if it's black lines on white page, they don't have a clean rectilinear edge like I have here. So this space and this space could be equal to this space because these are all clean edges. Oftentimes drawings don't have clean edges, so you're not going to have clean spaces between drawings. So you have to sort of balance it out. Other times a drawing might not fit, and so you have to make a compromise on a space between the drawing. As long as it feels right, it can be okay. Um, that said, I would also encourage people to crop an image. Let's let's say they had it. You had an image up here, and it didn't come down this low. But if I made the image a little bit larger, and I cropped off the side, because maybe just a little piece of landscaping wasn't needed to make the spacing between drawings equal, I, oftentimes that is a, a good move to do. That when you're going to put together a full presentation board that you can crop images down to help make your margins and your spaces between drawings equal. So let's take a look at these examples. So you can see, again, I think this group has done a pretty good job at it. Uh, like when you look over here, all the spacing over here, that's, that's all equal. Like when you get over to here, well, you can't really space these things equally because they have uh, you know, different boundaries. That said, this whole rectangle itself sort of reads as a unit. So I think there's a way, a way that they, they've been able to get away with it, right? You know, over here, maybe this is larger, but that's just because the drawing wouldn't fit. It wasn't really croppable, you know, and that happens. That said, I would say if there, if, if there's a place for improvement on this one, I would say it's probably with this interior rendering right here that, um, you know, I think they probably could have made this larger to come right up to this edge and have the spacing equal and then just cropped probably a little bit of the ceiling away would have been just fine to do, right? So overall, very good. I mean, even these spacings over here are very similar over there. It feels very well organized. Uh, so for the, for the most part, very good job done. Maybe one drawing uh, could have been edited a little bit. Here, you know, much simpler project, but certainly this spacing between drawings in this case is pretty much equal to the margins. So that's good. And the space between these drawings at this closest point is pretty much that same space. Um, so not too much to worry about there, I think, but, but overall good balance on the board. So, so we'll say good job there. And then um, another really interesting fact that I sort of like to use is that you should so when you when you're organizing drawings with consistent margins you're organizing them with consistent spacing the, the thing that you almost start to get is 
or an organization of columns and rows, which is very good. But in the column and rows, you should prioritize columns over the rows. And I don't know if this is because it's just the natural way we see or if it's just because that's what lots of other things do that we're used to it but it just works out better and when i say lots of things do do it what i really mean is like look at any newspaper look at any magazine look at any book they all prioritize columns over rows it's not to say they don't use rows as we'll see in a second but if you had to make a choice prioritize columns over rows especially if it's multi-page document like a portfolio or something like that which is very much similar to a magazine and so we can see here, what I mean by that is we can see some bunch of rectangles. Again, the dark images are meant to be like drawings, placeholders, and the gray is the page size, and the red lines is the margins. And you know, here's a column, and here's a column. And they don't necessarily line up in rows, but it's very well organized. That's opposed to this one. I have the, I have the red X over it, uh, but we see, the, um, we see that there is basically a row because there's a line that goes all the way across the page here. Um, and uh, you know the columns sort of bleed, and it's okay drawing. This wouldn't be a bad layout, uh, especially in such a simple format. But again, if you had to think and it was possible to prioritize columns, especially in multi-page, I recommend doing it um, that way. Let's see, and the next one. Oh, so here's the thing. Also, just because you're prioritizing columns, it does not necessarily mean that drawings don't go over a column. In fact, that can be very dramatic. We'll see reasons why coming up. But it, you can imagine that this, you, you can interpret this set of drawings, these gray squares, as a couple different things. The, the most straightforward is to interpret this as a column here and a column here, upon which is top drawing. If, breaks that column line that it goes over two columns but actually geometrically you can actually interpret it another way which is this drawing is actually three columns wide it's a column here and it's a column here and here these two drawings just happen across two columns and then this drawing covers over all three the point being if you have this general sense of organization of columns don't fit every drawing into this when i say prioritize columns sometimes students are like oh everything must fit rigidly into a column and that is not the case at all you should cross the columns but you know you might set up an internal grid uh, even mentally as you're you're working on it and as i said before just because you are working columns does not mean uh rows aren't used um, there might be some exceptions where rows prioritize over columns, but more frequently what really happens is you have columns and you also have rows, which is perfectly fine. It's not to say like, oh no, he said don't do rows and I have a row. Nope, that's not the case. As long as you're thinking about columns, if rows happen to also be there, perfectly good. So we sort of, that's what this drawing is meant to represent. You know, there's two, two to three columns here, uh, but there's also three rows here space of course this drawing covers up over two columns uh but there is it's still thought about as a column right so rows are still relevant and i should say sometimes break the rules you know these are these are guidelines maybe the better word might be guidelines they might be more guidelines than they are rules um and so it's a place to get you started to think about organization but sometimes you know for one reason or another you just don't want to follow the column. Maybe the drawing doesn't fit. Maybe by breaking the rule, it actually highlights a particular piece of the image or whatever the case might be. So um, strategically use it. Don't If you do it too much, obviously you've broken down the column into being unrecognizable. But if you do it just a little bit, it can really be powerful. But you don't have to, too. Like It's perfectly fine if you don't. If, you, if everything is perfectly within columns and perfectly within rows, you're also just fine. But the point is, don't don't over don't overthink it. So we so we can sort of look here. And generally speaking, you know, I would say that this one definitely rows are more easy to read, right? Because I I can come in and say, um, you know, this is a row approximately here. Let me do that in red, so we can actually see it better. There you go. That's a row here, and obviously the row row is is hidden here. So it's maybe a little more row than column, but I think it's okay because there there is sort of an implied column here. 
move my screen a little bit. Let me fix that. You know, you've got this thing here, and that that drawing goes across both. Obviously, when you get here, the drawings just don't fit. Like it's not really possible to take these and fit them into here. And I think that's just okay. There's an understanding that this basic column structure fits, but they were free to break it with no problem. And here you can definitely see that there are columns, and 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 you could say there are some clear breakpoints. We'll we'll see this. Um, why that they might exist but actually it's because it's multiple pages and we'll, we're going to talk about that in a moment but there's some super columns right here between where the actual pages of the printouts were made but even internally you have things like this page has a column there i sort of missed the point a little bit um, and a column here so this page is three columns big equally divided it's just that these images take over all three columns but well organized on this page right and so in, even in here you can see that there's there's this column line that exists here that even though this middle one breaks the column that's still well organized and this is still well organized on this side and the same over here you've got a really oh, sort of a little off there let me see if I can draw that one a little better right there pretty close to uh, you know to, to breaking it down and sometimes um, the drawings are broken from the columns, like these sections and elevations on the bottom. They just didn't fit, and they sort of make it stand out. They're very light, so I think by breaking the column brings your attention to them a little more. So, you know, for the most part, most every drawing is well within the columns organization, but um, sometimes it's broken. I think if I were to sort of uh, erase the columns really quick on this one, we can look at some of the rows as well. So, again, obviously there's the rows on each page are slightly different, and I think that's okay because it, it had a prioritization of columns. Um, so we've got a row there on that page. This page has a row here, a clear row here, a row here as well. And then on this page, basically continued that row here and a continuation of that row there. So uh, there are rows, but columns are clearly prioritized on here, and that's what makes it really good. Now, as I said, um, sometimes you want to break the columns. Ultimately, what that does is it makes some drawings larger. And one of the primary reasons for making a drawing larger is the concept of hierarchy, that some drawings are just more informative, more interesting, and tell the story better than other drawings. And you want people's eyes to be attracted to the big, important drawings, the ones that have hierarchy. Again, breaking the columns and making it bigger is a way of doing that. And and I think naturally, almost, um, you know, everyone who works this way is going to work this way. So we can we can take a quick look at, at this and see. Like obviously, in this one, we talked about this a little bit at the beginning. But the site plan, the overall site perspective, and the one building that they focused a little bit more on are the biggest drawings here. Um, the size of these images really go to drawing your eye over here. Also, the fact that they're full bleed help going that hierarchy. I find this one to be really interesting because, well, it probably is the third largest drawing on the page. So you sort of read this whole page as this triangle uh, from big to the to detail. Um, the contrast in this image also helps make the hierarchy. So everything else is very greens and whites, where this has this purple deep purple bluish colors too and so the the change of contrast here is actually another way of making this hierarchy hierarchically important um you know and the things that aren't a hierarchy a lot of the just simple plans with some information there you know they had to crunch some numbers and a floor plan which of course is important but at the level of describing everything not as important as everything so um so good job i think with hierarchy here and of course here um, similar things, the, the most important image is the exterior perspective, looking at everything and pulling it in, um, having the secondary shots be smaller. I, I would argue that there's probably, I know they were probably, they are trying to get in like the Sears Tower in that background there, um, but I, I feel like this could be a little larger, that there is a lot of water there. And by taking up that space with more building, it would have even given it more power. But I also do like how, again, I like how this breaks the column or breaks the row um, here because it gives this sort of importance because I, th I do think the section in many ways in telling the story is more important than the floor plan. The floor plan's there to show, hey, we met the requirements of what you were asking us to do. But the section says, this is what I'm about as a building. So breaking the row um, with that, 
uh, I think works well. Also, con the contrast, there is some contrast that pulls your eye down here as well. So I do think you sort of read it important. And certainly these drawings in the site plan reads the least, like it, the water blends into the sky, your eyes are not attracted there, it's small. It is an important detail why it's there, which is why it's there, but it's not the first thing your eye goes to. So I think hierarchically, it actually, even though it might have some room for improvement, just like anyone's drawings do, overall very good, very sophisticated for an early project. All right, what's next? Oh, so we're gonna jump over to text stuff now. And I also think that students often under the value, uh, undervalue the role of text in the way people perceive drawings and presentation boards, um, which is why I'm gonna talk about it now. It's sort of like margins, but you gotta spend some time thinking about it. Once you do, it'll go quicker. So some font basics, just very quick things here. There's basically two kinds of fonts or two kinds of type. There's serif and there's sans serif. Serif basically means it is the letters with the little extra tails and detail to them. By that, I mean like, like this S has that piece there and the A sort of bulbs out right over there. You know, and they have these feet feet heads and tails and all of those things and sans serif basically means without serifs which are much cleaner uh font um you know things tend to be more similar thickness there's no tails heads and feet uh, but within those two kinds of font there's many many different fonts within that that they do the serifs one way or another way or the the sans serifs one way or another way and they all mean things and that and that's the thing you want to make sure like just as in all symbols and colors and everything else text equally means something. So choosing your font is really important and you should think about the font that you're gonna use on every project. Uh, so typically a modern building is going to usually be like sans serif font just because of clean lines of the building, straight structure, things of that nature. It leads itself to a similar kind of font where other buildings that might not be might use a different font. So I, I have on the left here, I've got these these examples. You know, modern architecture, um, sans serif font, very clean. But a fancy hotel where you're gonna spend a lot of money, maybe it has gold leaf patterning, it's got tea time. I don't know, I don't spend a lot of time at fancy hotels per se, but it's gonna use very heavy scripting, lots of serif to it. And that this set that says there's something fancy going on here. This is not something you'd just use for a steel and glass building. It wouldn't match, it tells the wrong story. You know, in this one, I said a library, I used a pretty traditional serif font because that's what books use for text. Actually, often books use the serifs. And I think originally they were partly invented because it helps reading words together. It helps letters sort of blend into each other to read a word as a unit versus the space between words. And I think there's some studies that basically show it's actually easier to read serif font at regular print uh, than, than sans serif font. I'm talking about books and things like that. When you're talking about presentation board, like a title, things like that, the legibility, it can be read. It just matter how fast you're reading it, right? And so, so if you're doing with a library that is meant to be reading books and using a font like that makes a lot of sense. It says library. And then the last one here, I sort of have tech company headquarters, you know, which could be anything, certainly could be slicker, but it's sort of very almost robotic like font because it takes curves and almost turns them into straight pieces. Uh, so that sort of implies, you know, like early technology kind of stuff. It might make sense for a technology company. Wouldn't make sense for a fancy hotel, right? So spend time thinking about your font. It's important. I have told students that font does not go with that drawing and they're dismayed. And I said, this is why we talked about it. You, you need to change your font. Please change your font. It will help your drawing. They eventually believe me, but it's just one of these things. Maybe they heard me lecture about it. Maybe they fell asleep, who knows, whatever. They forgot to think about it when they did the drawing. It doesn't take long to do. And they realize, oh yeah, well now that I've done it, Good call, good call. I will say too, like it's one of these things, it's when you're first starting out, it takes more time than not. Not only, you know, there's a set of experience. If you're working in any software, there is many, many fonts. And I think sometimes it can be overwhelming. Like what font should I start with? Should I choose? And when I was sort of a younger practitioner, if I was doing a drawing, I might spend 
a relatively long period of time testing different fonts. How does this one look? How does this one look? How does this one look? Making copies, looking at them, comparing them before I ultimately chose one. That takes time. I mean, it doesn't take an extraordinary amount of time, but it does take time. And I know if you're stressed with school and have deadlines, or even if that's true at work, you might not want to take the time, but it's worth it. And ultimately, over time, the experience does come and you start to build a familiarity, familiarity with the fonts. And you start to build a reservoir of the fonts you like to use that work with your style, that work with your architecture and all of those things. So it does become quicker uh, as time goes on. But, you know, trying things and uh, basically like anything in design, doing iteration, meaning doing it over and over again, not worrying about failing the first time and willing, but as long as you're willing to go ahead and change it and be open to new ideas, that is how you want to approach fonts too, because they, they can say a lot. Um, the other thing to, to know about your text and your fonts is don't be afraid just because you're using one font. Don't be afraid to use different kinds of font sizes, types, and, and all the settings that you have available to you in a full presentation board that, that you know has multiple drawings on it. Now that said, while you want to use, you can use different kinds of fonts and styles you do want to be consistent when consistency is called for. So what I mean by that is something like room labels, scales and things like that, where you might have, you know, if you have a floor plan, a floor plan might have several room labels. You might have multiple floor plans. So you're going to have many, many room labels. So you want all your room labels to be the same for the most part, right? You don't want one room to be this, one room to be that, another room to be something else. That said, a room label is obviously going to be a lot smaller than the title. You want your you want people's eyes to be attracted to the title and for that to stand out, um, especially if you give the title a good name. So just as basic uh, ideas when you're working with architecture and presentation boards, what you might set up. The title is probably going to be bigger than everything else big and bolder. Um, the drawing names will probably be the next size, like, you know, this is a first floor plan, this is the site plan, so on and so forth. Then when you get to things like a descriptive text, many people either are required to or like to put a little paragraph or a design statement, whatever the case might be in text, you might put that down. That could be a different font and then all the extra little details, room labels and scales and things of that nature could be something different. Now, it doesn't mean they all have to be different. So like if you decide your descriptive text is the same as your room labels, oh, perfect, perfectly fine, right? But certainly that's probably going to be different than your title, not only in size, but definitely in font. And even if you want to crisscross um, some being serif and some being sans serif, you can do that when it makes sense to do that. Uh, it doesn't have to be, I just sort of pick different types to show they, they can be mixed and matched um, as needed. And so let's go ahead and take a look at the drawings here and see how these students have done. Well, interestingly, on this one, there's not a lot of font at all. They got a little bit down here. They're using a sans serif font, which I, I guess makes it, there is some modern architecture here. This is a very organic, and, and my guess is any organic font would have competed with that and A, not matched it, right? Because unless they made their own font, they would have difficulty there. So doing a very simple sans serif font probably makes a lot of sense. And they're, let, they're letting the words take take care of themselves there. On this one, the, the text is uh, pretty small because this is a big presentation, uh, sort of condensed down, so we don't see it. But we can see the title up here. It's fairly big in the grand scheme of things. We're going to talk about sizes and recommendations on that in a moment. Uh, and it's white, and it's up here in the top left corner, which makes sense. You sort of see they. They have sort of a subheading here of the, the arena. So there was sort of the urban design and they did this specific study. So you see that that's an important concept just through through font itself. It's sort of like a subcategory of drawings. And then you can't read them, I'm sure, on screen, but you can see the little black squiggles. That's the drawing names is yet at a different size. So biggest, different color, second biggest, uh, and then smaller here. Again, it's not uncommon that architects like to work with sans serif because it definitely feels more mod of uh, modern and contemporary than serif font. So all of this looks like it's sans serif, which is perfectly fine. But still, there's a little bit of plain font to really enhance telling that story. Jump back into here. So 
Uh, know your media and your text size. So some basic rules. Again, anything can be broken here. Guidelines, I guess, not rules. Um, for fonts larger than 12, 12 point, I mean there, uh, any font works under pretty much any circumstances. By that, I mean it could be any font, specifically sans serif or, or serif font. That said, when you get to 12 point font or smaller, there are differences. So, for example, in print, like in books, like I was talking about early, ser serif font is easier to read. And so if you're writing a descriptive paragraph, you might consider using it. Um, that said, screens, especially earlier screens, um, the serif font, the little tails and heads and all those things couldn't render well on the size of the pixels monitors had. And so it wasn't easier to read in serif font, that the lack of them, the sans serif font actually became easier to read. That said, things are rapidly changing uh, and there are more and more pixels being contentioned. In fact, as of when I was recording this, I think it was yesterday, there was rumor that the next iPhone, I forget the number now, but was going to jump up an order of magnitude and a number of pixels on their screen. And certainly at a certain point, when there's enough pixels on the screen, it's going to fall back to, to, to the fact that for small size text, serif font actually does have an advantage. That doesn't mean you have to use it. You just need to think about, about it. I just want everyone to know, because I find that's an interesting fact. I like to know that most people can read one kind of font over other kinds of font in some situations. It can help inform what I do. That said, I do know there's some architects out there who really hate, who are such strong modernists that they hate uh, serifs. Uh, which I think is a little overboard. You should, again, maybe if that's a guideline, that's one thing. If it's a strict rule, that's that's quite another. But you do have to be careful, especially if you're students looking for jobs. If you want to be more open, I would generally say there's no, there there. If, if you happen to run into an architect who hates serifs and you're showing them serifs, maybe they wouldn't like it. That said, people who probably don't care um, they aren't going to care if it's all sans serif, right? So you're, if you're really looking for a job, especially with dealing with something like a portfolio, you want to be a little safer. Um, you might really just stick to sans serif all around. But you know, I like different things, and I like texture, and I like uh, understanding these things. So I will use serif at times, and it it does make sense. But that's that's totally up to you. Um, Another thing is just like the rest of your drawings, your text should also be in columns. So I just took this image from the earlier slide and threw in a, some silly text right down there and I sort of put it into the column organization. Generally speaking, when you if you're writing a bunch of text like a paragraph, and that's what I, uh, what I mean by in a column, uh, you know, and, and all this stuff is if it's a title, maybe it's slightly off for a reason or whatever the case might be. But for paragraph text, um, it should be in a column and think about it between two and five inches wide for the best reading. If it's shorter than two inches, it becomes too skinny and looks very silly. In fact, that's what's really happening here because I wanted the text to be able to be read. This is meant to be more like a representation of a 24 by 36 board or like even an eight and a half by 11, but it shrunk so much to get the font to read. It's such a skinny, skinny line. Um, so it needs to be at least two inches to make the letters feel good. That said, Five, over five inches, it starts to get hard to track your reading back to the next line. Um, you know, even when you look at, that's why you look at newspapers and magazines, they their page size might be eight and a half uh, inches wide or wider, but they don't put text from one side to the next. In most books, um, you know, their actual text area is around that sort of five inch mark plus or minus because it's a comfortable distance to get enough words in but it's still be able to track through and read so when you're thinking about that again another little tip to sort of think about as you're reading and then there's paragraph justification um i see you know it's standard left justified which is what this is is what much much text is if you're if you're writing like a report or something like that this is the easiest to read and it might be perfectly fine. The problem is when you're dealing with a presentation board, this ragged edge that this creates sometimes doesn't look as attractive, especially if you're trying to keep things in columns and things like that. So the sort of justified on both sides, left and right, as long as you make the bottom, as long as it needs to be, um, sometimes this can be, the bottom line can be justified too, and that looks weird. So the last line shouldn't be justified. The rest of it can be left and right. 
can fit really neatly in columns, sort of has an architectural feel of angles. So if you're putting on a presentation board, it works really well. What I generally find doesn't work well for just justification in almost any setting, there are exceptions. Again, these are guidelines, not rules, but is the right justified? I often see, see this, maybe because it's on the right side, but just really hard to read. And the hardness of reading this text doesn't make up for any look that it might do. You just go to justified on both sides if you have to. Um, and then the one that I see a lot of students do, because I think they're thinking about alignments and things, they'll do like center justified. And that just looks awkward too. It just it just doesn't work. It's hard to read. Just um, again, if you're sort of feel if you're in a situation, just go to justified on both sides instead. Of course, there that's for paragraphs. If you're working with a single line of text, maybe it's a room name or it's a drawing name or a title or something like that, aligning them to the left or to the right or to the center, you have much more freedom. Again, just be consistent. If all your plans are aligned to the left, do them all to the left, if they're all to the right, do them all right justified. If they're all centered, then do them all center justified. Those are for single line text, but for paragraphs, pretty much for long paragraphs or books, things like that go with left justified for presentation boards that you're fitting in the columns and whatnot, go with both side justified. It's basically the, the, the rules that you should follow there. Of course, there's a red dot here, so I get to go to the drawings. Um, there's not a lot of, uh, of text on these pages, but uh, we can sort of see here, we can see they're pretty much using left justified. There's there's no paragraph here, but they're using left justified for all their drawings. There is one exception, which is right here. And you know, I think that's okay looking at it uh, because if, if they put it here, it would have gotten caught up with athletic green. So I'm looking at this one right here. Um, and you can see it's right justified, but if you put it here, it would have been confusing. So, you know, I think there's a, a place where, hey, we broke the rules. so. Um, of consistency, but it works pretty well. I probably would have done the same thing. So, so good job on that. Now, up to this point, a lot of the sort of guidelines I was suggesting, they are for single pages, but a presentation doesn't just have to be a single page. And all those rules would apply to multiple pages as well, but sometimes you just need more than one page and you want to follow all those rules like margin spacing and titles and fonts and all those things want to be consistent like I talked about, but um, you want to use it on multiple pages. Um, and you have a couple choices on multiple pages. You have what's sort of being implied on this slide, which is each page is separate. Um, but I think more sophisticated and one that I, like to use and encourage my students to use for their final presentations is to take multiple pages and put them all together um, so that they are technically multiple pages but it reads still as one image uh, and as i mentioned before you know all things being equal you want a landscape presentation but especially when you put all the pages together the page, whole page orientation is landscape, even though each one was printed out portrait. So you can imagine maybe this is a 24 by 36 and 24 by 36 and 24 by 36. So the height is still 36, but now it's six feet long, right? So um, so I think that you can sort of think in that way, well, my, I want a landscape design, but uh, sort of landscape presentation, but I'm gonna print in portrait pages. Uh, perfectly fine and a clever way of doing it, especially, you know, that sort of comes down to what your plotter can handle and other things like that. And then when you have multiple pages, if you are going to put drawings together, some drawings can cross the page. So for example, that's what this is representing. Like here's a big drawing, it crosses the page. Here's a big drawing, it crosses the page. Now when you do so, you do want to be careful. You don't want any important content necessarily to cross the page. Like certainly this one, it's sort of off to the side, you're probably okay. But you know, the most important part of the drawing, you try to keep on there because you can never get the joint perfect. So you want to keep on a single page, but you know, you can really get big and interesting by crossing the pages. So we can take a look at how the students sort of dealt with some of these things. And I sort of mentioned this before, this one is a multiple page drawing. Um, the page basically breaks down right there. There's a single page not well drawn in line, and then there's a single uh, page there. Most all the drawings fit between the two pages. There is one ex exception, which is this uh, 
elevation down here and I think it makes sense the way they fit their elevations together and you know it, it works well but uh, you could be more bold in how you cross pages uh, with drawings if you want or not but nonetheless you know I can present this as a single board layout even though technically it was three boards so don't be afraid of working like that either is keep your background simple usually I stick with either white or black because you want the architecture to be the thing that's reading, the thing that's telling the story, um, not the background. And I think a lot of times students and young designers, they start with their background, they start with their page, maybe they don't even have any drawings on there thinking, oh, how can I make this interesting, unique, and really stand out, because that's going to be fun, it's going to look good and hopefully help my grade. Um, and so if I have a really cool background to the page, that'll work. And what usually happens when you do that is that all the drawings get muddled. You can't really read the background. You, then you can't really read the foreground drawings and nothing works. Sophisticated design is usually always the simpler design. Um, and so you go with it. Now, again, are there exceptions to the rule? Sure. Uh, but keep background simple. In fact, we're going we're gonna to see an exception here when I jump to the drawings. Uh, in fact, I'll just flip to this one here because arguably this one doesn't have a black or white background, but it's in the spirit of a black or white background. It's a blue background, I would call it, right? And, it, and it's a different interpretation of blues along the way, but it's simple and, that, and that's the key thing, right? You can interpret this down here, even though it's a deep blue as a black color. Uh, and that really builds into this water, which is meant to sort of operate as partial background, especially for this section, um, and up into the perspective, and then the sky, which is also a blue or a cyanish color, a lighter blue, um, is also the background for these images. But because there's a few drawings on here, so they could get away with a little bit of this, but really black, white, but really any solid color can work as long as it doesn't interfere with the rest of your drawings. Um, and I have seen many people do something similar to this where they take a sky and the sky will start out and sort of even in the transitions most sky has sort of a gradient in it, in it but then maybe just photoshop in a consistent color at the top and then you can lay drawings over top of it that's about as fancy as i would get because it is simple the drawings are over uh you know just a solid color and that makes sense so keep your background simple and of course i'm sure you know in this one already it's basically a white background I like white, it's clean, it doesn't even waste ink, and uh, I think you can set off the drawing really nicely and play with white space and, and other things with it and make things that are dark really stand out and special. So I'll often use a white background. It's obviously the simplest background you can get is a white background, but I think it's just as good, if not better, than any other. So don't feel like you have to do something fancy with your background. You don't have to, to make a great presentation. And here's the perfect example of this. One other uh, concept I guess I should go over is talking about software. Um, and, you know, in the particular class that this video is specifically made for, we usually use Illustrator, um, which is great for creating new drawings. I also think Illustrator is great for doing a uh, presentation like this where you have multiple pages. Um, because you can actually do it all on one screen. Um, you know, this, there's a concept called artboards, which is right here. And this isn't the original file. I've collapsed it all down uh, for my own records. But you can have one page, two page, three page sitting right here and cross them all without having to worry about it. So it's a great thing to use for presentation boards. Um, and any layout, because it, you have so much control about moving drawings around and things of that nature. Illustrator works great for presentation boards that you're going to print out that are single pages. They work great for presentation boards that might be multiple pages, but sort of read as one holistic presentation nonetheless. That said, of course, in, there's the other software, InDesign, and we don't get into InDesign in this class. That will be for another class studying in portfolio. Um, but InDesign is very much like Illustrator in many ways, uh, but it's really great for multiple pages especially when those multiple pages are used like books or magazines or like portfolios. So if you're going to flip a page over and flip a page and flip a page and you want consistency, all the same rules that I've talked about in this presentation, the consistency, columns, fonts, and all that stuff, they still apply. 
but it's that software is really optimized to help making that consistency happen from page to page to page. So uh, that's uh, just some quick notes about software. So before I, before I end you, the last thing I will just say, like anything, take time designing your presentations. Don't be afraid of moving things around, getting feedback from others, faculty member, colleagues, whatever, whatever the case might be, other students play around, move it around, test, fail, continue to work what's best. That's how all design thing happen, not just drawings, not just design, but even presentation board layouts. Um, and also um, use precedents, just like anything else. Go to Google, you know, you can put in architectural presentation boards or any, like maybe there's a magazine that you love the layout of, any of that is valuable to look and say, what did they do and how can I translate that into my work? So those are two broad lessons that should always be learned uh, and, and you'll have successful drawings. So good luck. Thanks for watching.